Good afternoon. My name is Nathan Lujan. I'm ROM's Associate Curator of Fishes, and I'm delighted you could join us today for ROM Connects, this ROM Connects digital program. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that the ROM sits on the ancestral lands of the Wendat, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Anishinaabek Nation, including the Mississaugas of the, of the Credit First Nation, since time immemorial to today. I'm delighted you could join us today for a conversation that explores how eating locally sourced fish can contribute to the health of humans, local fish populations, and the Great Lakes ecosystem, and help mitigate the impacts of climate change. In today's conversation, I'm delighted to welcome Affinity Fish co-founders, John Clip and Matt Taylor. And I'm really hoping that uh, indigenous uh, fish supplier, Jordan Chigano can, uh, can join us right now. We're hoping uh, that she might just be running a little late, but uh, we're, we'll be staying tuned. Is that Jordan? Yep, I'm here. Hi, Jordan. It was so hey. good to see you. So good you, you could join us. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, um, we'll be talking to, to Matt, John, and Jordan about their uh, work to encourage people to eat premium freshwater fishes from the Great Lakes. Uh, the chat window is open, and as we go through the conversation, you're welcome to submit questions, and we'll then, then we'll get to those questions later in the, in the, in the, in the conversation today. And we really look forward to, um, to engaging your curiosity in this conversation and, and welcoming your questions to, to John, Matt, and, and Jordan. So I'd like to welcome my guests. John Clip and Matt Taylor are co-founders of Affinity Fish, a Toronto-based retail and commercial seafood supplier whose goal is to provide people in Canada with a higher quality of fish and seafood through careful handling, minimizing animal suffering, and prioritizing sustainable fishing practices, fish by fish, from lake to table. John has been working in the restaurant industry for the past 10 years, spending two of those in Kyoto, Japan, since returning to his hometown in Toronto, he has focused on changing the seafood industry to highlight the world-class quality of fishes in, the, in Canadian oceans, rivers, and lakes. Matt has worked in professional restaurants for over 12 years, developing a keen eye for quality seafood, as well as an understanding of fish aging practices. The desire to work with seafood from his home that is handled with reverence and attention to detail is what drove him to start Affinity Fish. And Jordan Chigano is a member of the Robichaud, Robichaud family commercial uh, fishing team that works closely with Affinity Fish to supply sustainably sourced fish from the territory, the traditional territory of the Saugeen Ojibwe Nation traditional territorial waters. Welcome Jordan, Matt, and John. So I'd, I'd like to just kind of cover some basics uh, with, with the three of you uh, before we open up the floor to, to audience questions. Uh, starting with, with Jordan, I'm wondering if you could tell me a little bit about what the Robichaux commercial fishing team does, where you fish, how you fish, and what happens to the fishes you harvest. Okay, so uh, Robichaux commercial fishing was uh, officially established in like 2018, where we became a um, actual business. So um, we are fishing out of the traditional territories of our nation, which surround the Bruce Peninsula from uh point clark all the way around to like the collingwood area so uh, we actually have two commercial fishing vessels one the benjamin charles that's located in Southampton, and we also have another vessel over on the thornberry side that is called the wm isaac so uh we've been fishing well alan's been fishing for 25 years um throughout his uh <laughs> his illustrious career. Um, but then we actually just got into doing our own business. We bought our own boat, then we just kind of started going from there. Uh, fish prices weren't the greatest. So we just decided to kind of venture out and start selling directly off our boat as that is our inherent right to do. So um, then we just kind of got involved with Matt and John and it just kind of led into something even bigger for us. So we are super excited to be joining forces with them and providing them with the fresh fish that we uh, provide for everyone else as well. How nice is it to be working with your family? It is, um, it's pretty good. Uh, we have two young, or two young, two um, adult boys, Avery and Ethan. 
Um, Avery is a smoker actually in our building. Ethan is working on the boat with his dad. We have Julie, Alan's sister, who does the dock, um, the door on the dock. Um, and uh, we have my niece that will come in and she'll help pin bone every once in a while. So um, yeah, it's just a whole big family, family business that uh, we're doing. So super happy to do it. And uh, just being able to provide fresh, uh, fresh fish for everyone is just we have gotten so much feedback that the fish is just amazing. And to hear that coming from people, it just, you know, it warms my heart because that's basically what we're here to do um, is to provide the freshest fish available. And how, how broadly do you sell the fishes that you harvest? Uh, where all do they go? Where all they end up? Um, the furthest actually right now is to the guys down in Toronto. Um, but we do have people that, you know, uh, come up to the park, uh, the Cape Croker Park and stuff. We've just kind of recently like kind of panned out up there. We have uh, sent fish um, probably down towards like the Kitchener area. We have like friends and family that always like, well, could travel with it. Um, we do local, locally around here. We've actually done our powwow last year, which was kind of a big success for us too. Uh, our first time venturing out, but it was really well. So I kind of think that we're going to reach back out and do that as well. But starting out, out as a small business, it's kind of hard to do, yeah. but, uh, we're, we're getting through it. We're managing and, uh, we just kind of, you know, we're expecting to get better. So, yeah, yeah. Well, Matt and John, could you tell us what the process is of, of getting these fishes down from Georgian Bay and the Bruce Peninsula to Toronto? Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, we're super lucky to be working with uh, with an operation like uh, Jordan and Alan and their family. Um, uh, basically, we uh, uh, we are the middlemen, so we connect um, the fish that their boat uh, catches with restaurants, uh, here in primarily, you know, Southern Ontario, Toronto, Niagara, and, um, uh, well, the GTA. Um, so, uh, when we first started working with them, we were going out on the boats, uh, about once a week and fishing with them and, uh, you know, setting up a system that, um, uh, that worked for us and that, you know, would, would allow us to keep those fish, um, in the best possible condition all the way to, uh, you know, from the Bruce Peninsula down to uh, uh, Toronto. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, now it's uh, almost a well-oiled machine. So we're, uh, we just got some fish in from, uh, from Julie, Alan's sister, uh, last night. And um, yeah, I mean, now we're, we're picking up fish once or twice a week from them. Um, yeah. So for, for, for people who don't know anything about seafood and, and uh, where their fishes come from or, or how fishes end up on their plate, uh, what what is the big difference between uh, oceanic fishes that that they might be more familiar with uh, and fishes from the Great Lakes? It's interesting, right? And you you are right. Most people here in Toronto, certainly us growing up um, here in the city, we are more familiar with ocean fish, which is uh, uh, really strange, being that we're in the middle of the Great Lakes region and we hardly have any ocean coast in in Ontario certainly none that's very close to Toronto um uh, so yeah why is that why is it that uh we're all used to seeing tuna red snapper um sea bass and all these ocean fish from um usually not even Canada and you know most people here in the city would have a hard time identifying a white fish or a lake trout or you know a, a smallmouth bass or these you know endemic um local native fish um um, and yeah, I mean, I, I guess history has a lot to do with that. Um, right now, we live in a world where uh, globalization has really, it's, it's the, the leading force in our food economy, right? Uh, we can get avocados from South America and, um, you know, dry goods, spices, and now even fish from all over the world um, in our supermarkets. And for, for a number of factors, we're marketing handling um you know in some ways the ocean fish lend themselves better to this kind of industrialized handling of food um so unfortunately yeah i mean we are seeing more and more um we have been seeing more and more um ocean fish being sold in toronto rather than the local the locally harvested fish mm -hmm. uh, just to give us uh, an, an idea of what these Great Lakes fishes are like to, to consume, 
could each of you maybe tell us uh, what your favorite fish from the Great Lakes is to eat and how to, how you prepare it? What it is that, what are the characteristics of that fish that, that you really appreciate? Maybe starting yeah. with Jordan. Uh, we get this question like a lot. Um, what, what our favorite fish is and how to prepare it and how much to eat. And so what I usually tell people is my favorite fish would be probably the pickerel, uh, the walleye, as people like to... <laughs> make the differential between pickerel and walleye. Um, I like walleye and I could go for anything deep fried, but my son also makes a solid oven baked white fish too. So uh, I'm not too much into the oily fish, but um, white fish and pickerel are the way to go. Yeah, awesome. And Matt and John? Yeah, I would say for me and John, uh, with our backgrounds as chefs, probably what we're most interested in is uh, species that are a little bit more lesser known and bycatch species, that kind of thing. One of the ones that surprised us the most in the past three years of working with uh, the Robichauds uh, was the burbot uh, or freshwater lingcod. Um, really, truly an amazing fish. Uh, wasn't really ever used for commercial, uh, had any commercial value up until the time that we started selling it before, uh, besides for cod liver oil after World War II. Um, but yeah, really interesting fish, uh, has these beautiful, uh, fatty livers that are amazing, very similar to monkfish liver that they use in Japan. Uh, but also the fish flesh itself, it's a little bit more, um, uh, attributed to like, uh, wet heat applications. So, you know, stewing fish curries, steaming whole is really, really amazing. There's a lot of collagen in the skin and between the flesh and the uh, skin. That's just one of my favorite fish to eat. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, my wife and I stopped by Affinity Fish and we got, uh, well, she came in first and she got some of the burbot liver pate. Really love that. She loves a, a pate mm -hmm. for, for spreading on bread and crackers. And then um, then we went back for some burbot filet and uh, did, a, did a baked um, uh, burbot filet. It was yeah, really delicious, very firm uh, flesh. Mm -hmm. And like you say, that really thick skin, very distinctive. A monkfish. Yeah, yeah, like monkfish. Um, well, Jordan, could, could you tell us some of the different ways that, so you mentioned some, some frying and baked fish. What are some of the different ways that, uh, that fishes are traditionally prepared in, in your community? Generally around here, it's just deep fried. Like we have like a few, um, people like stands, like uh, food vendor stands around here that will, um, deep fry it and then just serve it up with like French fries or whatever. Um, and then just people bake it. I actually have um, fish going out today for a workshop up at um, our Madoki Senior Center. And they are going to be doing like a fish processing prepare. And then they're going to be handing out some of the fish that we have provided. So um, yeah, they, they can kind of do whatever they want. And then they generally post pictures of what they do. So people will have show pictures of their deep fried fish or their oven baked fish or, you know, kind of whatever they do with it, but even their sides look pretty good. So yeah. um, just any way they really want to cook it um, is generally just baked and deep fried around here. Is, but is, uh, is, I think the, fur the further you go down south, the more beautiful and <laughs> more things you can do with it. So I'm <laughs> actually, I've never tried the burbot from the guys down south. So I, I actually wouldn't mind trying it. I'm all about trying something once or twice, or it depends if it's good or not. And I'm sure it is, boys. <laughs> well, I, I'm I'm from even even further south. I'm I'm originally from Tennessee, and uh, we like to to smoke uh, suckers every now and then. Make a smoke smoke sucker dip is really good for for oh, nice. chips and dip. Um, well, Matt, Matt and John, you're you're both trained in a in a very distinctively Japanese approach to handling and preparing fish to eat. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about uh, how that tradition might change people's per <laughs> per perception of what eating Great Lakes fishes is is all about? Yeah, um, you know, uh, Japanese cuisine can be a lot of things. And, you know, the angle that we're really um, drawing from, which is the, their uh, reverence and, and well, creativity with, with fish and seafood, um, you know, they, they have a very kind of um, specialized way of, of looking at each fish. And, um, you know, here in North America, I think the, the stats are something like 95% of the fish consumed here. Um, is only five different species. So we're, you know, we love what we love and we're not really interested in, in anything else as, a, as, a, uh, as an economy. Um, but in Japan, there's all this, uh, you know, reference for um, fish, uh, you know, hundreds of different species and, um, you know, uh, uh, hundreds of different cooking applications as well. So 
you know, there's fish that lend themselves very well to one application, you know, they're fantastic steamed, but terrible fried, or maybe they're fantastic fried, but you can't grill them. And they're not seen as, as um, uh, any less worthwhile, they're, they're appreciated all the more. But, um, you know, it's, it's acknowledged that just that's, that's how you eat them and they're, they're unique and they're, um, they, they lend themselves to one particular method of cooking or processing. And, um, and it's something that's, um, you know, that's celebrated. So we're, we're trying to find uh, uh, which, which methods uh, suit our local fish here in Ontario the best. And um, yeah, finding out, you know, what, what those individual ways to celebrate each fish are. So has that been a process? Sounds like that's been a process of innovation. Uh, what kind of surprises have you encountered with, with adapting these techniques that you've mastered with, with oceanic fishes and, and bringing them here to the Great Lakes and the Great Lakes fish fauna? Yeah, for sure. As, as Matt was saying earlier, the burbot liver, the, the liver from these freshwater cod are incredible. As soon as we'd never seen, I'd never seen one of these fish in person until I was out um, uh, on the boat with, uh, with Alan. And, um, you know, as we were processing them and gutting them, these livers were coming out and they were, uh, proportionally to the size of the fish, just enormous. And they were white. You could tell that the fat content in them was extremely high. Um, and, you know, the first thought that kind of popped into our head was this looks just like a lobe of, you know, duck or goose foie gras, which is, you know, of course, mm -hmm. in the culinary world, uh, worth its weight in gold almost. And um, yeah, so we, we brought them back and we've been playing around with those for a few years and, you know, really ironing out a, um, uh, a cooking method that suits them best. And yeah, I mean, those have been, those have been fantastic. Such a, such a treat to get out of the, um, uh, the lake um, and number of other fish as well, like freshwater drum, certainly an underappreciated species. I think over on the American side, they refer to them sometimes as trash fish when they're, you know, sport anglers will fish for walleye and catch drum and, you know, think that it's down, you know, down, it's, down it's south, we, down south, we refer to them as Gasper goo. I don't know if you've ever heard yeah, that. Name, but... Yeah. 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 <laughs> Which I mean, I'll, I, I'll take that over trash fish any day. In terms of name. No, they're, they're uh, delicious. Yeah. Yeah. Um, fantastic, fantastic fish. And yeah, you know, just, um, <laughs> some creativity is all it takes. Yeah, so, so how, how long have you been in business so far? How long have you been open? We started, uh, we started working on the wholesale side uh, just about three years ago now. We've had the retail shop open coming up on 11 months, so just, just, uh, just under a year. Okay. Uh, yeah. And what has what, what the public reaction been like so far in your first year of, of public uh, retail business? That's been really, really great. The first two years we were doing it, we were supplying uh, mostly restaurants and hotels and the food service side. So we would, you know, we have great relationships with chefs here in Ontario. Um, we would show them the fish, kind of give them some guidance on, on preparing and, and cooking it. Um, and then, you know, we drop off the fish and then we leave and that we kind of hand it off to them. So having the shop here, being able to interact with, you know, locals one-on-one, um, -on -one, help them cook there dinner, whether it's going to be, um, you know, for themselves or their family, and then also doing the events that we do, the dinners that we do here in the space and actually being able to cook for, uh, for people here and show them all these different species and all this variety that comes out of, uh, out of the Great Lakes is, that's um, yeah, really rewarding, you know, it's, it's, it's a treat to be able to do that. Yeah, I think, I think for a lot of Torontonians, this is a completely unknown, even a bizarre or exotic culinary option that they've never experienced before, even though we are, as you mentioned, embedded here in the Great Lakes, right on the shore of Lake Ontario. Um, yeah. I'd like to kind of discuss with the three of you some of the, some of the mm -hmm. conservation concerns or maybe challenges uh, that, uh, that, that, that we face in, in, in terms of ensuring that this uh, that this resource is sustainably harvested and is, is available for future generations. Uh, maybe starting with, with Jordane, uh, I'm wondering if you, you could talk about maybe any, any changes that you've seen in your lifetime or maybe uh, previous generations talking to elders in your community about how uh, the environment has changed in the Georgian Bay or maybe how the fish community has changed. Have, 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 you, have you been noticing changes or has it uh, been, been well, pretty changing? It's funny that you say that because um, I actually used to work for the Chippewas and Maywatch Fisheries Assessment Program. And um, that job entailed me to um, actually follow the fishermen around, take biological samples, and our office would age the scales, age the fish of, 
the uh, the whitefish in particular, because that's what the harvested fish in our area was um, and still is. So it was, um, it's, we're kind of in a decline right now up in the um, Lake Huron area. And it is, oh, sorry, I'm just kind of looking over at the webinar chat. Um, and it's, um, like I said, we're in a decline right now. And um, so we only, we were limited to harvest in the fall. And just because of the decline, staying off the shoals and everything, but that's not limiting us to um, really catching like anything else. So we could um, catch the trout, we could catch um, the perch, set out in particularly for perch. Um, but we have noticed a decline over the past years. Um, I'm going to say maybe 20 years ago, it, the fish was so, the fishing was really great back then. Um, there was a lot of boats out there fishing at the time and they were, everyone, it was thriving back then. And I'm going to say probably within the 20 years, it has significantly dropped. And wow. that's just on the Lake Huron side. Um, I know for a fact too, over on Georgian Bay side, they closed area 5-9. I'm not sure if anybody's going to be in, you know, knowing what these numbers are, but they did close down the fishery over in Georgian Bay in area 5-9 because of overfishing, I believe. Um, but that's not in the territorial waters of um, Saginaw Ojibwe Nation. Mm -hmm. But we don't really have a whole lot of fishermen over on that side. We do, but they are punt fishermen, which is mm -hmm. like a smaller vessel, like not even a vessel. It's just actually yeah. like a little um, outboard motorboat. Um, but yeah, so that's kind of what we've seen. And we are maybe one of the last few fishermen up in our area that's actually fishing right now. Uh -huh. So uh, we're just kind of going on doing what we do, basically. <laughs> And, and uh, you mentioned overfishing. Are there any other impacts that you directly attribute these changes to the ecosystem being from? Um, yeah, also, because um, where I work now, I actually have to, um, we do, uh, we were looking at what the, stom what the fish are eating mm -hmm. and um, doing like stomach analysis of what, what the fish are eating. So that was kind of, it kind of coincides with what um, Newash Fisheries was doing as well. So um, they've been noticing also too that the uh, that inside the whitefish bellies is like a lot of um, zebra mussels and like just stuff that they don't normally eat, right? So, mm -hmm. and you can also tell too, like when the fish is coming up, they're not as big and thick as they used to be, right? Like I think they've just like really thinned out quite a bit because of the lack of food and nutrients that's in the water. Mm -hmm. so that that's probably a whole nother webinar. <laughs> Sure, sure. Yeah. Well, I'm I'm sure a lot of people around Toronto are are uh, have heard about Asian carp before. I'm wondering if you are encountering Asian carp in in in, in the Georgian Bay, and and if if that seems to be an issue for for your fishery. No. Um. Thank goodness we haven't encountered any of those. There was workshops that was being held in the community too for the fishermen. Um, that actually we were a part of, um, me on my working side, and then the fishermen coming in to actually be a part of. But mm -hmm. what they did is they were um, showing them like fish ID of different types of carp. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, just so they were familiar with, like, if they seen this odd carp that came up, that at least they could identify it and they could like let somebody know or let the fishery know that, hey, you know what, we're starting to get these fish around here. So mm -hmm. we haven't encountered anything like that right now. So Man. Cross the fingers that it stays that way. <laughs> yeah, good. And then Matt and John, I know you source some of your fishes from different parts of the Great Lakes in addition to Huron. I think uh, you also pull some fishes from around uh, um, uh, kind of the, the eastern part of Lake Ontario. Uh, what, what's been your perspective, kind of broader perspective of the Great Lakes and, and changes taking place there? <laughs> Yeah, um, well, you know, looking at the numbers, we've only been at this uh, here uh, in Ontario for three years, and it's hard to make any uh, analysis based on what we've seen in three years. You know, looking at the numbers, it seems like the 1880s were the, the really heyday of, of fish populations, and none of us were around then. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's, it's hard to uh, address uh, from our perspective, just because we've seen such a such a small snippet um, just in the past three years, but that doesn't mean that, you know, uh, we can't address the, the problems that we're seeing every day. And you know, one of the things that um, uh, I wanted to touch on, which is something unique to um, Alan and Jordan's operation and well, 
the 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 boats um, up there as opposed to the uh, the kind of the commercial non-indigenous boats uh, further south. Um, and you know maybe Jordan can help us understand what you know those those differences are um, uh, geographically and, and how the, the laws work. But um, you know one of the reasons we really uh, are so lucky to be working with them um, is because we're able to you know, access such a, a broader range of species. And one of the reasons that um, uh, that overfishing has been a problem is because there's so much pressure on so few species. And really in the Great Lakes, it's been, well, in Huron, it's been primarily whitefish. That's been the real cash crop, uh, uh, for lack of a better word. Um, and, you know, there is a ton of pressure on those fish and they're, you know, all the boats, um, that had been out historically were primarily fishing for, for whitefish. And, um, you know, because there was so much pressure on one species, um, uh, there, there was considerable impact. And what we're really trying to push is, you know, in the future, one day, you know, being able to harvest, uh, set fewer nets, harvest a fewer total number of fish, but be able to utilize all of them and have more, more efficiency that way. I think as a total North American statistic, um, the, the utilization rate for fish and seafood is somewhere around 25%. So when you see, you know, when you take home fish, um, there's three times that amount that hasn't made it to the, uh, to the consumer. Um, and, um, you know, that's, that's really sad. That's, that's something that we need to work on as, um, uh, uh, as a community. Um, so yeah, being able to work with, uh, with, the Robichauds and being able to access all these different fish and be able to, you know, when, when fish come up in the nets, be able to really um, uh, appreciate and sell everything uh, is, uh, uh, is, is fantastic, yeah. Yeah, and you mentioned some of the different uh, characteristics of those different fishes. So from a culinary perspective, from a gourmand perspective, you know, all those different fish species offer different aspects, different characteristics, different textures, flavors, opportunities totally, totally, to prepare yeah. those fishes in different ways. Absolutely, yeah. It's um, an exciting it's an exciting world for for uh, someone who hasn't yet explored the Great Lakes uh, uh, yeah. food offerings. Well, uh, what, uh, going back to that question of of invasive species, I'm I'm wondering if um, if if you've uh, explored any recipes with invasive species from the Great Lakes or uh, thought about ways to to prepare and and, and market those. Yeah, um, uh, you know the the invasive species that uh, that were I guess that I'm aware of, you know, being the um, the sea lamprey, the round nosed goby, yeah, the Asian carp. Um, I was actually, I don't know if it was in Tennessee, but we were, we were following somebody who had started an operation there. Um, I believe they were canning um, the Asian carp and they had found, you know, the bone structure is tough to work around on those. And they do tend to have, especially in the North American market, there's not a lot of um, tolerance of fish with lots of fine bones that are hard to remove. So canning was one way that they were getting around that. And, um, you know, I, I from what we've seen uh, being out on the boats um, with the Robichauds, um, I, I can't say we've gotten a ton of invasive species. It's also unique to, you know, the method that, that they're fishing with nets. Um, uh, but um, yeah, I mean, there's been uh, um, talking to um, some other fisher folk on the lake. Um, we were being told the story of the um, the lake trout uh, in the lake and the fact that the, um, the Ontario government had been stocking lake trout with the hopes of kind of improving the sport fishing, which in turn leads to, you know, more people uh, uh, looking to buy cottages and, you know, it affects the, not only the huge sport fishing industry, but the, uh, the property prices of, of property on, on the, on the, on Georgia Bay. Um, and um, kind of the, the disastrous impacts that the stocking of these fish, which are, you know, uh, they're endemic fish, they're native fish, they should be there, but not in the amounts that were being stocked. So they were being basically bolstered and, uh, uh, and that was having, you know, that, that was putting imbalance into the, um, into the ecosystem. So, um, you know, we're, that's, that's a, a, a fish that, uh, that we love working with for that reason. And, you know, it's one of those things where the, the, the more that we're able to eat of these fish, the more pressure we're able to take off of the, um, the ecosystem. Well, one of the most popular fishes in the Great Lakes uh, is smelt. And uh, yeah. that's actually a fish that's not, not originally native to the Great Lakes. Um, 
one of the uh, one of the one of the mo more recently discovered kind of invaders of the Great Lakes from within North America is the flathead catfish. So we now have a population of flathead catfishes in the Thames River in the the western part of uh, Lake Ontario, and uh, and they get quite large and have a big fillet. And <laughs> I imagine it wouldn't be too hard to to create a market for for those. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> what uh, I, I'm a I'm a I'm a catfish guy. I, I work on mostly South American catfishes, but uh, big fan of, of of catfish fillets and fried catfish from the South. What what is the what is the catfish market uh, like in the Great Lakes? Are there any catfishes that that you deal with or or that uh, get brought up by the fishery? We don't catch a ton of catfish, or sorry, uh, Alan doesn't catch a ton of catfish. Uh, we do get maybe three to four a year. Um, I don't know if it's specifically flathead catfish. But there are other oh, channels. They're channel. Channel, channel catfishes, yeah. Um, and they're fantastic. Uh, they're yeah. absolutely amazing. We tried, we did a dinner series last month, I believe, which was just a one night only. And a lot of these fish, you know, because they are so rare, we wanted to kind of highlight them and do a whole dinner series around them. Um, yeah. So we did a eating dinner series. And one of the courses was um, a Japanese marinated uh, grilled catfish. And it was honestly one of the best things we've ever tasted. Um, <laughs> Yeah, super proud. We only got like one small fish, so we can only serve it to about 28 people total. But wow. it is a really amazing, really fatty, super delicious fish. Yeah. yeah. And here in the uh, in the Great Lakes, you know, these lakes are not really comparable to other uh, freshwater bodies around the world just because of their size, right? These are some of the largest bodies of freshwater on the planet. And, um, you know, with that comes uh, a level of, uh, well, the water's being so deep is, is much colder. Um, and, um, you know, the, the actual flavor of the fish is very different. If you pull a catfish out of a small pond, or if you pull a bass out of a small pond, um, or a warm river, you know, they tend to taste like the environment they come from. So they tend to have, you know, a little bit of, you know, maybe muddiness or earthiness to them. And that's where a lot of these cooking techniques, the blackening and, um, uh, you know, the tendency to smother stuff in tartar sauce and, you know, uh, and that's that's a good way of dealing with that problem. But coming out of Lake Huron and Georgian Bay, the water there is so cold and so clean. These fish are really, really incredible on their own. And you can actually, um, you know, I was the, the first time we took apart a, a channel catfish. Um, I was, you know, wincing a little bit, and, you know, you uh, know, anticipating the worst. And I was really, really blown away how how beautiful, how clean, how sweet the flavor was. Um, and it's, you know, genetically the same organism, but coming out of a totally different environment, cold, deep, clean water, and, and they taste totally different. So to, to that, that same topic, uh, a lot of people's concerns about eating sushi generally, and maybe even, even more so for freshwater is parasites and, and how you treat yeah. them. You know, if you're not cooking fishes, uh, uh, or wondering if you could comment on to the extent to which you're you're eating any raw uh, fish products from the Great Lakes, and then how you're treating those for to minimize any any risk of of disease. Yeah, hundred percent. So we do serve raw freshwater fish, which uh, you know requires some very special handling. Now, obviously, with any raw food, whether it's iceberg lettuce or um, you know bluefin tuna, um, there's always risk eating things raw, and you know even cooking something doesn't necessarily eliminate hundred percent of the risks. Generally, it's considered that with ocean fish, most species, it's reasonably safe enough to eat them um, raw without prior freezing. Um, and it's generally considered uh, a higher risk to eat um, freshwater fish raw. And the, the higher risk is, is in parasites. So um, there's a few species of um, uh, like flukes and tapeworms that you could get um, from freshwater fish. So it's generally considered the, the most uh, cautious and the safest way to handle that is to uh, freeze the fish first. Now, usually the, um, the uh, misconception with, with frozen fish is that, you know, it's going to be uh, of lesser quality. It's going to be mushy. It's going to be that, you know, bag of frozen amorphous filet that you see at the supermarket. And it really doesn't have to be that way with proper freezing and more importantly, proper thawing of the fish, you can preserve almost with some species like the, uh, the pickerel or the walleye. Um, it's almost really impossible to tell the difference between properly handled flash frozen fish and fresh fish. The only difference is, you know, the, the risks have been mitigated. You, we're not worried about parasites anymore after prolonged freezing. So um, that is something we do. We don't serve any fish and we, you know, uh, 
always make sure to educate the chefs that we're selling our fish too, that, you know, it does have to be fully cooked or flash frozen. Mm -hmm. um, so that is, yeah, that is something we've been able to do. And that's something that, you know, historically has not um, been common with, uh, with freshwater fish. And some of them yeah. are just fantastic. You know, the freshwater drum we were talking about before, the lake trout, um, the pickerel, all really, really delicious fish to eat raw after they've been frozen. Mm. Well, we have a question from the chat uh, from, from Lauren. Uh, she says, my husband and I enjoy perch, usually pan fried. Do you know how the sticks of the stocks of perch in Ontario are faring? How are the perch doing? Uh, maybe Jordan could could uh, address that question. Um, we only really set out for when there's like a high demand for it. Um, it's a different set of um, net mesh that we set to go and actually catch perch, but we don't go and target it. So we don't really know how how well it is doing or not. I do know down south that they do um, a lot of um, a lot of perch fishing down that way, I believe. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, it's, it's like hit and miss, but when they do come up, they will come up, <laughs> come up nicely. Yeah. So I, no I noticed on your boats, you were setting gill nets. Is that the primary method for, for harvesting in, in Georgian Bay? Oh, it looks like Jordan might have gotten frozen there. Um, <clears throat> That, that is, yeah, that, that yeah. is their primary uh, method of fishing out there on the boat. Um, in Lake Ontario, there's a little bit of what's called like impoundment fishing, where they're fishing with these large nets that are actually, they act as traps. Um, and instead of catching the fish in the gills, the fish are kind of funneled into a box where mm -hmm. they're harvested from. Um, but yeah, I mean, primarily it's, it is gill netting um, in the Great Lakes. Um, uh, it nope. is... Sorry? No, no trawling? No trawling that I'm aware of. Um, yeah, that's, that's done out in the ocean. Um, part of it has to do with like the larger investment um, on the mechanical side. The boats need to be much, much bigger to handle the trawling. Um, and then licenses as well, you know, for, uh, for non-Indigenous fisheries, um, there's very, very strict specifications as to what they are allowed and not allowed to use not even just um, with, you know, trolling versus gill netting, but the material, the gauge of the plastic that, you know, their nets are made out of, the diameter of the holes that are in the nets, what seasons, what times, uh, the area, and then, yeah, the actual size of the net that they're allowed to fish is all very, very strictly uh, regulated. So it doesn't leave a lot of uh, room for, you know, uh, playing around with different, uh, different methods of fishing. Yeah. Sure. And, and Jordan, looks like you're back. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I froze. <laughs> no worries. Um, so we're just talking about methods of, of, of fishing. And, and uh, I know one of the distinctive aspects of your cooperation with, uh, with Affinity Fish is how you're euthanizing the fish. After they, they're brought up, uh, there's this method of, of ikejime. Uh, wondering if you could, could comment on, on that and, um, and, and how the, the fishes are ethically harvested. Yeah, um, I, I do know a bit about it from just what the guys say. I'm not really actually on the boat that much, but I have um, seen uh, like my son that's on the thing on the picture screen there, for instance, they know how to do it more than I do. So um, I think that's I'm going to have to leave that there. But um, I don't know. We like the way that it's done and uh, we think it's amazing, but it's a lot of work, you know, mm -hmm. um, as opposed to like doing the rest of the fish that we have to do but um no that we do what we do to provide the freshest fish for for everyone so it, it's part of the job and that's what we do so may, maybe matt and, and john you could you could address that uh and, and maybe contrast the way fishes are more typically harvested or maybe used to be harvested relative to the technique that that, that you've encouraged uh folks to yeah. use your suppliers yeah so First and foremost, I think we should mention that uh, the technique of Ikejime is you know, derived from the Japanese culture. They've been doing it for hundreds of years. Um, but when me and Mer me and John first started uh, testing it out on freshwater fish, nobody had really done that. Um, I don't think there's any kind of recorded examples of anybody trying it on freshwater fish. The anatomy of freshwater fish um, is generally similar to saltwater fish. So we kind of had an idea that it would work. But <laughs> when we first went out of the boats, we didn't know for sure. Um, but it turns out that Yes, it does work. It does do the same things anatomically and it does uh, improve the quality after uh, harvest. Um, so basically it's 
it sounds super complex and I think a lot of people are intimidated by it, but it is pretty straightforward. Uh, basically, it's kind of a three step process. Um, one of those steps uh, we decided to kind of remove just for uh, efficiency's sake and just because uh, it's not super necessary because you're not trying to eat the fish raw right away. Uh, but the first step of the process is that the fish has to be alive. Um, so when the fish comes up in the nets, in the gill nets on, on the uh, uh, Benjamin Charles there, they will uh, basically have a winch that pulls the net back onto the boat. Um, when they're pulling the nets back in, the fish are still alive. We don't take any fish that are dead. Those uh, get sold to any other suppliers that they sell to. Um, but the first step of the process is to brain spike the fish. So um, this instantly kills the fish. It's more humane for the fish. The alternative and what was being done before is usually kind of just taking the fish, put it into a gigantic plastic tote, and they kind of just flop around until they're uh, deceased. Um, the brain spiking, what it does is it's, yeah, it stops, stops the brain function of the fish. Um, one thing uh, to note is that the heart of the fish is still pumping and that's super important. That's why you need the fish to be still alive. The next step of the process is to cut the gills of the fish. The gills are the fish's lungs and what pump the blood through the circulatory system. Once you cut the gills, what you usually do is put it into an ice slurry or a, a big bath of ice. And what that does is bleeds the fish out. So as the heart still pumps, it pumps the blood out of the circulatory system and allows um, for that, you know, any residual blood that would generally, when the fish kind of flops around and, and passes away that way, it just stops where it, where it stops. And, and that is always the first thing to attract bacteria, uh, always the first thing to smell fishy, always the first thing to help uh, decay that fish. Um, so by bleeding it out properly, basically what you're doing is you're prolonging the shelf life of the deceased fish. Um, so that's what allows us. And then also, I think it's, you know, about 20%, 10, 15, 20% of that is, is, is what uh, contributes to the quality of our of John and I's fish when we sell it to restaurants. But I think everything after the fact of that, you know, handling it properly, taking it out with two hands, making sure you're not dropping it on the floor, you know, being delicate with it and treating it like the beautiful wild animal that it is. Um, I think there, that really goes a long way. And I think that's a lot of people or uh, a lot of times people treat fish as a commodity more so than a, a, than a wild animal. And I think that, you know, just uh, viewing it as that um, kind of just promotes the quality in the fish. So yeah, the steps of the process, brain spiking first and foremost, bleeding the fish out properly. Um, and then the final step would be uh, using a wire uh, in Japan, what they use is a wire and they basically uh, put it down the uh, spinal cord of the fish and destroy the nervous system. Um, this is more so important what we, me and John have found if you're going to consume it raw immediately after or pre rigor mortis um, for our fish because we are aging it as well as you know selling it to restaurants, hanging it in a fish uh, in the fridge, just like this photo here. Um, we don't see the need for that part of the process. We've tested it both ways, uh, but yeah, I'll let John speak to that after. Yeah. Um, um, the, the, you know, the, the focus of, or the, the intention with Ikechime, first and foremost, is to improve the eating quality of the fish. So by, you know, by killing the fish quickly, of course, it's, you know, uh, kind of a more ethical and humane way of, of handling it. But you're also preventing the buildup of stress hormones in the fish, things like lactic acid and cortisol um, that, you know, breaks down the flesh, it, it, it uh, degrades the texture of the fish. Um, you get a lot of kind of off metallic flavors as well. Anybody who's eaten a piece of fish that was, you know, really kind of fishy for lack of a better word, you know, it's funny because that's not the fish. Those are other things. Those are the bacteria that have grown on the fish um, post slaughter that that's, you know, all these uh, uh, enzymes, adrenaline and things like that, that are uh, uh, present in the fish from um, lack of better slaughtering. So, um, you know, with Ikejime, we're trying to prevent those stress hormones. We're removing as much blood as we can from the fish. Again, that blood is energy for the muscles. It's also kind of a free meal for, for bacteria. So um, especially when the fish is coming back to us and we're planning on um, dry aging it for, you know, sometimes up to two, three weeks. Um, when the fish is processed, you know, it's handled carefully, it's bled out, it's killed quickly, that fish will actually improve in eating quality. Um, as the skin dries out, as the flavor of the flesh concentrates, um, you know, sometimes over those two, three weeks, we're, at, we're ending up with a better product than we had on day one. Whereas with conventionally harvested fish, uh, where less care is taken, where the fish is full of blood, where the fish is full of, um, you know, uh, these uh, kind of stress hormones, um, we're not able to do that. You see kind of immediate degradation of 
of the fish. So you mentioned dry aging. What are uh, some of the different techniques by which you're you're tre you're treating fishes and, and preserving them? Are, do you do you guys smoke fish also? We do smoked fish. Um, a lot of people when they come into the shop and hanging pole like that, they think that it is smoked, uh, but that isn't the case. Basically, once the fish has been slaughtered in the method that we just uh, talked about, uh, and uh, we receive the fish in the city, uh, basically all we're doing is you know giving it a final clean. Um, we usually take the fins off of the fish because the fins tend to, uh, in the drying process, stick to the body of the fish and create moisture pockets, you know, obviously dry aging, and any kind of uh, thing like that, you, your moisture is your enemy, it creates bacteria. So we take the fins off the fish um, and we hang it through the, t we poke a hole through the tail. If you poke a, if you try to hang it from the head, the head ends to, to rip off after a couple of days. So it's not great for that. Uh, so we hang it from the tail as you see in the photos there and basically, we, we're always constantly trying to uh, innovate and change the way that we do things. And we basically, for each different species, we'll use a different method on how to hang it because we've noticed different things happen after, you know, two weeks and we're like, how do we fix this kind of thing? So uh, all the fish are scaled. They get scaled in different methods. Um, all the fish are kind of scraped down. Uh, they're washed in, in the water that we have here at the shop that we get tested, you know, two to three times a year. Um, and then we get the kind of scrape the excess moisture off. And then we spray it with a solution of uh, basically a certain type of alcohol. We use sake uh, in the shop and a little bit of like a high concentrated salt brine uh, just with a spray bottle. And what that does is the salt creates kind of a protective layer. Um, and because it is on the skin of the fish as well as the, the, uh, the, line, the, the chest cavity lining, it doesn't actually affect the flavor of the fish at all, um, but what it does is create that protective layer for uh, any bacteria to uh, make its way into the actual flesh of the fish. Uh, the salt creates that barrier and then the alcohol from the sake basically evaporates and gets rid of any excess uh, fishy odors that would be there. Uh, and then our third and final process is that we use an ozone gas machine in our fridge. So at the end of the night, once we've hung every fish up, we basically turn this gas machine on. And so it's not good for humans to breathe in, but it, what it does is fills the space with the gas and it kills surface bacteria. Every time we get a new shipment of fish in, we will run that ozone gas machine again. And it basically um, strip any odors, that kind of thing, but also yeah, specifically any bacteria that would be starting to live on the fish. Um, That's where it kind of veers and kind of separates from you know, aging red meat or pork, that kind of thing. Yeah, amazing. Well, this has been a fascinating conversation and, and uh, really exciting to, to have uh, both the, 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 the lake to table component, having Jordan here and, and Matt and John. Uh, thank you so much for, for joining us and sharing your, your personal experiences. Uh, a, a quick plug, if you're interested in Affinity Fish and would like to try some of their offerings, they are going to be cooking out, uh, grilling out this weekend uh, for the Dundas West Fest, the, the Due West Fest cooking some uh, salt grilled whitefish, some Japanese marinated lake trout, and some uh, hot smoked whitefish rice balls. So swing on by and uh, check out Matt and John, say hi. And um, uh, for those of you who are interested in exploring more of uh, the Great Lakes fish offerings, the ROM uh, at the ROM gift shop uh, can uh, provide you with a field guide to the freshwater fishes of Ontario. So this is the second edition. It just came out a few months ago uh, with about 100 new illustrations, uh, detailed keys and identification guides to the, to the fishes mm -hmm. of, of basically the Great Lakes. Um, so a great place to start in exploring the, the diversity of freshwater fishes around us here in, in Southern Ontario. We hope to see you all again. Uh, more information on in-person and digital programs can be found at rom.on.ca. So thank you again for joining us. Have a good afternoon. Bye-bye.